because it's time. Uh, okay, recording is progress, so we were reminded the session is recorded. Uh, good evening, uh, good afternoon, good morning uh, to everybody joining us for another uh, preparatory session uh, for the Internet uh, Governance Forum. This one dedicated to the issues of environment, sustainability and climate change and the role of digitalization. The purpose of this session, as with the other uh, pre preparatory or introductory, if you wish, sessions uh, that we are organizing this week, is to kind of set the scene uh, for the IGF. And in this session in particular, we would like to discuss the role of the forum as a player. Does it have a role to play or what role it can play in the discourse uh, of environment and digitalization? Uh, it's of course a very special week for the topic that we are uh, we are covering with COP26 happening at the same time. So it would be really good uh, to try to connect the dots also also with that process. My name is Teresa Horaisova from Diplo and the Geneva Internet Platform, and I'm also a very proud Mac member, and I will be your moderator uh, for tonight's event. I will not be the only moderator because I will be or should be joined with Afi, uh, Afia Edo, who is joining us from Togo and who I hope uh, that we will sort out the little connection issues. Uh, that said, uh, that means that we would really like you to be active in the chat. Afi and I will be following the chat and making sure that any questions or comments uh, that appear there are brought up to the attention of the speakers. So please use that because the session will be as interactive and interesting as we all together uh, make it. I cannot forget to mention another important colleague and a MAC member as well, Mrs. Juliana Harcianti, uh, joining us from Indonesia, who is the facilitator for this issue team uh, of, the, uh, of the MAC, uh, preparing for the IGF, meaning she's kind of the mastermind behind putting this session together, as well as the main session uh, that we will be having um, in Katowice in uh, December. So what is the format of the session? How are we going uh, to approach it? Uh, first of all, uh, we will, of course, try to set the stage and try to explain some basics about links between environment and digitalization. We will then cover other aspects, such as how can multi-stakeholder parties contribute? What is the role of uh, Global South or how can Global South um, uh, take advantage? We will then roll to the more specific segment of the session, dealing uh, with the role of the Internet Governance Forum uh, in all this and what the IGF should do. Uh, please rest assured that uh, whatever you uh, bring up to this session will and should be used uh, in December, but should also be used uh, uh, in, in the work of the Internet Governance Forum as such, including the work of the newly uh, kind of formed uh, policy network on environment and digitalization that we will hear about uh, quite soon. We will finish this session with a little update on what can be expected um, in Katowice in terms of workshops uh, and, uh, and the main session uh, that we will be conducting uh, so that uh, you can hopefully see that uh, it's, it's an ongoing activity. It will not be a one-off effort, but an effort building on many, uh, many activities that we are involved in uh, just now. So that's kind of for the format. Please let me know if anything is unclear or if you would like to approach it uh, differently. And with that said, I would like to uh, introduce our speakers. They will be coming up at various parts uh, of this uh, session, but I would also like to encourage our speakers uh, to jump in and react to each other uh, during the whole uh, session, not just at the particular segment, because that I think can be quite refreshing. So we have with us uh, Livia Valpen, who is the policy advisor uh, for international relations at the Swiss Federal Office of Communications. She's joining us from Switzerland. Uh, good uh, evening, uh, Livia, to you. We have with us uh, Mr. Daniel Akinmane Emejulu, who is the program manager for UN efforts uh, in Microsoft. He's joining us from Switzerland as well, coincidentally from Geneva. Uh, good evening to you, Daniel, as well. I hope we already have with us, but we'll introduce him anyway at this moment, Mr. Gustav Hariman Iskander, who is the director of Common Room Networks Foundation. Uh, Gustav, not sure if, we, if you're with us already, but if not, hopefully in a minute. 
furthermore, we have with us Mr. Rashid Kauka, also joining us uh, from Geneva, and he's the executive director of Cuts International in Geneva. And finally, we have with us uh, Mrs. Valeria Betancourt, who is the manager for communications and information policy at APC, at the Association for Progressive uh, Communications. Uh, welcome also. So uh, that is not the last speaker because uh, uh, I should also mention, of course, Mrs. Florina Vespi, uh, who is the consultant for the policy network of environment and digitalization of the uh, Internet Governance Forum. Good evening also to you, Florina. So without further ado, I would like to uh, jump in the first segment, uh, which should kind of set the stage for our discussion. And for that, I would kind of like to ask Livia to take the floor. So Livia, over to you, please. Sure, and um, thank you very much, Teresa. And hello, everyone from Switzerland. I hope you can hear me well. Perfect. So I'm, I'm very glad to be with you uh, virtually today for this uh, introductory session on the issue area of environmental sustainability and climate change. I think um, we are all aware that mitigating climate change and ensuring environmental sustainability are really one of the most pressing issues of our time. And uh, the internet and also other digital technologies um, such as blockchain or artificial intelligence, they really can pose a considerable challenge um, to the environment. I think of, uh, for example, energy consumption, the problem of e-waste um, and so forth. But there is actually also hope uh, that digital technologies can help us to protect um, the environment. And um, the Swiss government, and actually really also me, me personally, um, we consider um, these interlinkages uh, between digitization and the environment as really highly important. And I'm therefore really glad um, that the, the IGF as the world's leading platform for multi-stakeholder um, discussions on really all aspects of digitization is putting um, this topic on its agenda. And actually already for the second time um, this year after the first time um, in 2020. And I think it's also really um, timely that we are speaking about it today um, while the COP26 uh, is ongoing in Glasgow, as um, Teresa has already mentioned um, in the beginning. And just as a, as a side note, I think it actually also fits well that the IGF this year um, will take place in a hybrid format in Katowice, where actually the COP24 um, took place in 2018. So yeah, let's hope that this will um, create some good spirits uh, for meaningful discussions on, on, on this topic. From, from the Swiss government side, we've been observing um, the growing interlinkages between digitization and, and the environment for, for some years now. And this is why we, we commissioned a study on digitization and the environment uh, from the Bern University of Applied Science. And this study um, really tackles um, the opportunities, the risks and the need for action um, in this field. And uh, as a starter, I would really like to just briefly share the main outcomes um, of this study. So actually regarding the risks, I think on a very general uh, level, it can be said that digitization has an accelerating effect on our economic system. And this system has been really um, characterized for several decades now by an excessive use of natural um, resources. And then also new technologies um, are associated with high energy um, consumption. For example, um, for, the, for data production, storage, um, use and, and transfer. And there is, of course, also the problem of the high use of resources in actually producing ICT hardware. And then also the challenge of e-waste and, and recycling. But there are also opportunities. Um, digital technologies, they can help to, for example, decentralize energy um, production and to increase um, the efficiency um, of energy use. And also um, new technologies can lead to a more um, efficient use um, of pollutants, for example, in, in agriculture by, by using drones. And then digitization also has an impact on how the environment is, is being uh, monitored. So um, actually thanks to, to the use of ICT, more data can be collected, um, systems can be controlled more intelligently, um, and also new knowledge can be gained and new types of services can be um, provided. 
But then what is actually really worrying is that so far um, digitization um, has had a negative net effect on the environment. And this is particularly due um, to rebound effects. Um, this means that actually efficiency gains often result in an increased um, demand and then which in turn um, leads to a raise in raw material and energy consumption and also more emissions and, and more electronic waste. So um, I think to, to reverse this negative trend, um, action is really needed. And there, the Swiss study um, particularly emphasizes the need um, for more um, sufficiency and also uh, uh, the transition towards um, a circular economy, um, which would really keep resources, I mean, that can be products, materials uh, and energy in the economic system for as long as possible and also at kind of the highest value possible. And now coming back to, to the ITF, um, I think the forum is, is really ideally placed um, to discuss the, the quickly emerging issue of environment and digitization and really to shed more light on the interplay between, uh, between these two um, so-called mega trends. And by doing so, I think the ITF can really contribute to the overall goal of protecting um, the environment. Um, which is something that the um, UN Secretary General is also um, recommending in, its uh, in his roadmap uh, on digital cooperation. And just to say that this is also why we from, from the Swiss government, we decided uh, last year in 2020 to give some seed funding um, to this policy um, network within the IGF on the important topic of uh, environment and digitization. And um, Teresa, you mentioned it already, Farina Vaspi is here with us, and I'm very glad that um, she, as the coordinator of this policy network, um, can later tell us more about the important work um, going on there. I think to close, I would um, just really also like to positively mention that um, the topic is not only on the agenda of the global IGF, but also on regional and, and national levels. So the, the EURODIC, the European Dialogue on, on Internet Governance, has introduced uh, an intersessional track on greening internet governance, um, and also we um, are discussing it widely at our national um, Swiss IGF. And yeah, I'm, I'm really convinced that it needs um, joint efforts on local, regional and international levels and really from all stakeholders um, to make sure that digital technologies can indeed um, help us to, to protect the environment. So I think that's it for my, from my side for the moment and I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thank you very much. Livia, uh, thank you very much for that. Uh, I think it was an excellent entry uh, to the topic. And, um, you know, I'm glad that you mentioned some concrete initiatives because it's very easy uh, to say that an IGF, the IGF, uh, sorry, is an ideal place for connecting environment and digitalization. But yes, I would immediately ask, okay, what, what concretely can be done? And indeed, you know, at least setting up the policy network, yes, uh, has been kind of a very concrete answer, a step on the way, definitely not the ultimate solution, but a step on the way uh, to placing this agenda more prominently, uh, using um, kind of the benefits that the IGF is bringing as a gathering uh, uh, of uh, various stakeholder groups together uh, to, to pay more attention to this topic. We are, uh, we are a bit ahead of time because we will have a segment dedicated exactly to this, but uh, I'm really glad that, uh, that uh, some of your remarks uh, will very likely uh, be brought up uh, later, uh, later in the session. And another point that I would personally like to point out from, uh, from what you covered is um, the fact that this issue is coming up in the regional IGF uh, discussions as well. You mentioned Eurodic. Uh, I do hope uh, that uh, this will also come up later in the session when we also cover more the global south and developing, uh, developing countries. And if we have any organizers of other regional meetings um, in other regions with us, we would really be eager uh, to hear from you uh, whether these issues feature on the agendas of your national uh, or regional um, uh, forums. So Olivia, uh, thank you very much uh, for that. Um, so far, not so much uh, 
uh, in the chat, but I would like to uh, also encourage you, if chat is not your thing and you would like to contribute, you can also use the raise hand function, you know, to jump in anytime. And that goes um, both uh, for, the, for the session participants as well as, of course, for other speakers who are uh, welcome to jump in and, um, and uh, react. Uh, Jennifer is asking in the chat, actually, Olivia, if uh, it was possible to share, uh, share the link to the study uh, that you were mentioning uh, in, your, in your remarks. So, excellent. So uh, what I will uh, try to do now uh, is to uh, share my screen and invite you uh, to grab your devices for some very, uh, very initial uh, brainstorming. I hope you all can uh, see my screen. And what I would like you to do is either take your phones or uh, um, kind of scan the QR code here. Uh, if, you, if you go directly, uh, you can go uh, to the website menti.com and enter the code of the session. I am doing it along with you to make sure uh, that it works. And uh, we should have the first question. And I would just like you to ask you very, very briefly uh, to try to think of some words, you know, very short expressions about what comes to your mind uh, when you see the question on what can the IGF bring to global discussions on environment and digitalization. So please, you know, let's take a minute and let's, uh, let's try to uh, brainstorm a little bit together at the very, uh, very beginning of our session. And we should soon start to see the responses coming in if you, of course, don't let me down and, uh, and will participate with us uh, in the exercise. Okay, we have some first uh, words coming in. I'll just give it uh, give it a minute before uh, before I uh, go further. Thank you for participating in this. This is, by the way, as I as I let you uh, contribute to this exercise. Uh, some of you may know uh, that uh, we are planning a little different IGF this year, which will be taking place in a hybrid format. And uh, what is really important for online sessions or hybrid sessions is to try to make them more interactive, because um, we are of course missing the usual on-site dynamics, you know, just among the people in the room. So incorporating various you know, other tools um, in having the audience involved um, is quite important. So sorry for this little promo uh, that is taking us a little bit away uh, from, uh, from the session, but I just wanted to give you a minute and, you know, thank you. I will not read out uh, through, uh, through the expressions, but you can see that there are uh, quite a few ideas about what um, uh, kind of the IGF can bring and can, uh, can contribute. Um, circular economy coming up, global standards, more civil society, Society, uh, multidisciplinary. Okay, perfect. We'll not go through that, but I hope um, you enjoyed it and it gave us a little bit of a temperature check uh, of the room. So thank you very much for that. And let's immediately uh, check, check the chat, what has come up uh, in the meantime. Okay, the code is being requested again. I hope, you know, it seems that it has, uh, it has worked. So, uh, Sorry if you, any of you had some issues, you know, uh, I, uh, I apologize for that, but it uh, seems to have worked for others. So let's immediately jump in the second segment um, of today's uh, session. And that is the one uh, focusing on multi-stakeholder aspects of the dialogue and environment and digitalization and on the role of Global South in all this. So if you allow me, I would like to start with Danielle. Uh, once again, uh, Danielle from Microsoft, uh, for a manager for UN Affairs. Danielle, uh, if I may ask you, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Teresa. Thank you very much to the IGF for giving us this audience at the preparatory session. And uh, it's really wonderful to see a mix of new and uh, familiar faces. Regards to Paul Mitchell, I have the opportunity and privilege of representing Microsoft in the IGF policy network, looking at the interlink between environment and digitalization alongside Teresa, Joycey, some other members on this call and special thanks to Florina for all your good work, pulling us together and making that successful. 
Well, as Teresa has said, the reflection that I have been asked to provide input on today is looking at how different stakeholders can contribute to this topic and the role of the Global South as well. So I'd just like to share some thoughts and reflections with you. Microsoft is engaged in this topic, looking at the intersection of environment and digitalization, not only in the idea of p &E, but also at a very practical level. When you think about big technology companies, the elephant in the room is data centers as far as this particular topic is concerned and looking at the emissions and the energy demands of data centers. Bearing that in mind, since 2013, Microsoft has been engaged in renewable energy purchasing power agreements, which seek to offset our carbon emissions. We've taken that power purchasing agreement model where we consistently ramp up the amount of gigawatts that we purchase from renewable energy sources, and we've transformed this into a broader vision. And that broader vision announced this year is something called 100-100-0. And what this means is that 100% of our electricity consumption, 100% of the time, will be matched by zero carbon energy purchases. And that applies to our data centers. The reason that this is significant is that, you know, as, as mentioned, we've already been engaging in power purchasing agreements that are approximately purchasing 5.8 gigawatts of renewable energy sources. This is in countries around the world. But this scale by 2030 to have this 100% 100% uh, and that's a reference to our zero carbon energy sources being purchased 100% of the time will also apply to data centers, including in the global south. That's the global ambition. So that is long term and that is mitigation focused. But what about the more immediate term and what about things on the adaptation front? Well, Microsoft um, has developed an airband initiative, which is helping to connect people in rural and remote areas. We know that that's a big issue. How does this connect to the topic of the environment? Well, if you think about SDGs and you think specifically about SDG 2, and I'll come very specifically to the target level, SDG 2.4, that calls for sustainable food production systems and it calls for resilient agriculture practices. And so we believe technology can play a role here. And where we believe technology can play a role is that as you're looking for increased productivity to feed what is expected to be a population of 10 billion people by 2050, you're going to need to have increased food production by 70%. And you're going to need to be able to have crops that are climate change resistant, that are ex extreme weather and drought resistant, and that can also bear in mind our climate with uh, major flooding and disasters. And so bearing this in mind, a current plan and, and uh, activity at Microsoft is called Sun Culture. And this comes to the Global South aspect as well. Sun Culture was founded to help African farmers and it's improving productivity through solar powered irrigation and through sensors, drones and cloud-based learning models. And what these sensors and drones and satellites do is they give a farmer a very accurate picture of their soil. It allows them to make weather predictions. It allows them to manage pest levels and it allows them to practice things like precision irrigation, which is not just beneficial for SDG2, but also on SDG six, where we come to water and man managing water. It helps them with financing. It helps them with um, harvest. And, and by managing their harvests, it also boosts their um, income levels. So we've seen that technology can play a role at this intersection. It's a positive role in, in this particular instance to help with digitalization and environment intersection. The other point I just want to reflect on is that there is a human-centered aspect to this as well. In May 2019, Microsoft launched what is the Africa Development Center, and this represents the first Microsoft engineering offices in Africa 
there are two initial sites in, in Nairobi, Kenya, and in Lagos, Nigeria, which is where I happen to come from. And the African Development Center is a world-class engineering for talent who can use AI and who can use machine learning in areas such as agriculture and build solutions to environmental affecting topics. And so we can't forget the human aspect when we think about the role of the global south. And by the human aspect, I mean the ability for local talent to play a role. And this does require that all stakeholders don't only ask what the global south can do to play a role, but also contribute to the global south with innovation, with tools and the um, technology that can empower them, in, in the case of Microsoft, to positively connect the environment and digitalization. So these are some initial reflections and I look forward to more of the discussions ahead. Thank you all very much. And I thank you, Daniel. Um, if I may, uh, you talked a lot about the work that Microsoft uh, has done, um, obviously, and thank you for that. As we try to cover, you know, the multi-stakeholder nature of the IGF. So like zooming out uh, that you're representing Microsoft, can you general, in general terms, um, uh, tell us uh, what the, the private sector can bring to the discussion sure. in the IGF context? Sure. sure. Well, um, internet governance is part of the SDGs. If we think about SDG 9, Industry Innovation Infrastructure, and SDG 16, which is looking at um, accountable institutions policies. And so when we merge those two SDGs, if we can, this is where internet governance almost offshoots. If we also think about the SDGs, um, the 2030 agenda that brought in the SDGs requested for various means of implementation from the partners. The most commonly referred to means of implementation are finance and uh, capacity building, but there are also calls in those means of implementation for technology and for data to contribute as a means of implementation to the SDGs. So I think that private sector, and in the case that I speak for a technology company, can provide technology and data to help serve these intentions, because we all know that you can't manage what you can't measure, and that the UN um, high-level panel reports for, mentioned in 2019 that of all the SDGs, not one is removed from digital technologies in terms of its implementation. So in summary, Teresa, I think for every private sector company, the answer is different. But if you do look at the means of implementation, they, they do tend to run the gamut of what private sector can contribute to these discussions. In some cases, it's finance. In some cases, it's capacity building. In some cases, it's technology. In some cases, it's data. So I think in the spirit of SDG 17 and partnerships, those specific means are very key for private sector to contribute. Thank you very much, Daniel, for that. And I especially thank you for bringing capacity building, because I do really hope uh, this will come up uh, in, uh, in the next uh, kind of in, uh, in this segment uh, later a bit more prominently as well. So hopefully we will uh, we will get uh, get back to you. So uh, if your time allows, uh, I will immediately jump to uh, Gustav, uh, if I may. Uh, Gustav, can we hear your reflections, please? Hello, Teresa. Hi, all. Thank you for the time. Uh, if I may, I would like to share my screen and uh, start the discussion. Uh, I, I would like to share some uh, snapshots of uh, pictures and uh, text uh, before I... Uh, we, we can uh, arrange next. that. Uh, Eleonora, if I may ask you to check quickly if Gustav has the sharing rights, that would be awesome. You can yes. do it now. Yes, he does, yes. Thank you, Eleonora. Gustav, please go ahead. So I would like to share a story from um, Kasapuan Ciptagular Indigenous Community where I uh, working uh, on community network project in the past couple of years. Uh, the picture uh, you see on your screen hopefully uh, is uh, a picture of uh, Ngasek uh, rituals. It's like a rice planting or paddy planting uh, traditions that are using a wooden stick uh, like as you see on screen. And these uh, rituals actually just um, happened last year. 
uh, during of which uh, some of these uh, common uh, challenges and global complexities uh, are happens and up until now uh, like for example the uh, the uh, population growth it happens everywhere including in indonesia the increase of development between urban and rural uh, developments uh, the impact of uh, climate change as well as the latest uh, and is the uh, appearance uh, everywhere is the impact of uh, coronavirus uh, uh, global uh, epidemic and uh, as you um, as you probably noticed that the the indigenous community is a minority group which uh, consists no more uh, than four or five percent in global level but uh, this indigenous community is actually managed around uh, 11 percent of uh, the forest where uh, we can see uh, it contain more than 80 percent of uh, planet's uh, biodiversity uh, in which uh, the position of indigenous community is very important uh, so uh, a lot of people now see uh, how we can learn from the uh, indigenous community in order to uh, mitigate the climate uh, change uh, condition and now i would like to uh, introduce you to the in uh, in Kasapuan uh, Cipta Gelar Indigenous Community, where I uh, involved myself together with some friends uh, uh, develop, uh, developing the uh, local uh, uh, internet uh, infrastructure, uh, which uh, involved the local community. Uh, it located in the border area between West Java and uh, Banten province and uh, the population is around 25 to 30,000 uh, people uh, and they have a, a very deep uh, rooted uh, the culture with the agriculture with with ancestral uh, farming uh, tradition which rely on uh, environment a specific very specific environment uh, arrangement which uh, they uh, strongly uh, believe on uh, rice culture and uh, cultivation so why i share this uh, story about the indigenous uh, community because uh, from our uh, perspective uh, what we know for uh, the digital world today are still uh, originated came from the non-digital world and this indigenous community have a very specific customary institution for example uh, with the specific leadership and uh, specific uh, uh, social hierarchy with their role with specific roles and obligations and so on and they have a very specific way in managing and protecting uh, protecting the forest uh, for example they divided a forest into three specific zone uh, like for example entrusted forest a sacred forest and a rebel forest uh, in which uh, each forest area has its own uh, specific uh, function and meaning and this is the 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 the, the overall uh, map of the region of this uh, area of uh, indigenous community uh, and the green is the the, the, the forest area while uh, small yellow uh, spots is where the uh, village is uh, located and this is the map that we created uh, during the participatory mapping uh, project uh, to locate environment and cultural space uh, in this uh, region and as you can see uh, some of the uh, forest core forest zone containing a very important natural resources like water which uh, very meaningful for uh, to, to to the continuity of cultural and agricultural uh, tradition among the uh, indigenous community of kasapuan cipta gelar and they also have a very specific uh, water resource uh, governance system where, uh, where that are lead by Manintin or Ululu or the Ministry of Water, uh, which uh, uh, the name of Manintin is actually the name of bird that usually live near uh, by the water resources. And apart from forest and water uh, resource governance, uh, this community also have a very specific uh, agricultural calendar or agricultural uh, cycle, which uh, very close to the natural uh, order 
like for example uh, how they uh, uh, decide the uh, rice or paddy planting uh, system is marked by the specific star constellations uh, positions uh, which uh, somehow um, have a very uh, unique uh, connections with the microclimate the uh, water resource and so on and they have uh, farming calendars and guidelines that shows uh, each position of star constellations with specific uh, conditions uh, on microclimates and uh, activities uh, in, in, in farming uh, uh, calendar. And I would like to uh, take your attention into this uh, graphic. Uh, this is a collections of data that we are um, uh, studying, uh, which uh, shows the uh, rice production uh, and rice consumption, including the rice uh, stock, uh, because people of Kasapuan Ciptagular con uh, uh, indigenous community is prohibited to sell the rice uh, by tradition. So they only plant the rice for their own consum consumption. They use their own local seed uh, with uh, their own specific uh, traditional uh, techniques and so on. And I would like to uh, bring your attention into year 2015 where you can see a spike of uh, rice production in the uh, first diagram. And uh, what is interesting on this is that in Indonesia 2015, we experienced the uh, peak of El Nino, where we experienced a long uh, drought uh, season, where more than 100,000 uh, hectares of uh, uh, rice field is failed to be uh, harvested. But in Jiptaglar, uh, as you can see, the uh, rice production level is increased from the average uh, of uh, 4,000 uh, tons, which uh, suddenly uh, spiked into more than uh, 10,000 uh, tons. And as you can see, the level of, uh, because they keep the rice for their own uh, consumption, uh, specifically they keep the rice on the barn, uh, the number of rice stock that they have with the rice consumption level and rice production, you can see there's a, a huge uh, gap in which uh, people of Kasapuan Ciptaglar indigenous community somehow has reached this uh, ideas of uh, food sovereignty or so, uh, food security. This is uh, something exceptional in terms of um, climate conditions in Indonesia and its impact to uh, food production. And uh, this community also very have a very specific arts and cultural expressions, which uh, again, uh, strongly uh, rooted to the rice culture. And they also honoring the paddy seed uh, very uh, uniquely. Uh, as I mentioned before, they 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 uh, grow their own uh, uh, rice uh, seed. Uh, at least it it has um, uh, up until now. Uh, we have been recognized more than hundred uh, local rice uh, paddy or rice varieties, which uh, they uh, nurture every year. And uh, yeah, that is. Uh, uh, a little bit of story uh, when, I, when, 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 when I think about the uh, environmental issues and uh, digitalizations or internet uh, 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 utilization for the uh, environmental uh, to, to, to address the environmental uh, issues. Again, uh, once uh, short uh, conclusion is that in terms of um, uh, environmental uh, challenges both in local and global uh, level what is uh, what is uh, we consider digital are uh, still originally came from the non digital world so i think uh, uh, what is very challenging is that uh, how uh, we can uh, make sure that the local knowledge uh, that are uh, belong to uh, certain indigenous uh, community group in 
Indonesia or even in many part of of the world um, uh, are, can be um, accessible and can be uh, studied and can be uh, extend into the digital world. So uh, some of this local knowledge can be studied and can be understood and can have a significant impact in a global uh, level. So uh, thank you, Teresa. And, and Gustav, uh, I, I thank you because um, you know we've had uh, more abstract discussions up until now, and you have shared with us a very concrete project with kind of concrete measurable uh, impact um, in the specific context of one particular country. So uh, I actually think this was this was really refreshing to uh, to see. So thank you for uh, for your contribution. Uh, let's see also what reactions of others are either in the chat or using the uh, the raise hand function. But before uh, uh, I ask Afi to uh, to share with us what's going on in the chat. I would like to ask Rashid, the, the last speaker in this particular uh, segment, uh, to give us his perspectives uh, on um, uh, both the developing uh, countries' uh, context and and the multi-stakeholder uh, dimension. Rashid, over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Teresa, and I'm very grateful to IGF, to Diplo Foundation, Geneva Internet Platform for having this opportunity. As you were saying, it has been a fascinating session from Libya to Daniel and then uh, Gustav. Uh, very, very interesting. Uh, thinking of uh, uh, digitalization and environment, uh, I was reflecting on that and maybe what I'm going to say is a bit uh, echoing what Libya had mentioned. Uh, I would first of all must confess, and as you know, Teresa, that I'm not an expert in, in any, any field. My Most of my life, I worked on the trade side, and I tend to look at things from, from that. So in the trade, if I, if I look at that, there has been, as many people are aware, between the trade and environmental communities, there's a long history of debate and discussion and arguments of the need for synergies between trade and environment. And when reading up on digitalization and environment, I was struck that uh, there are some similarities of, of that. Uh, and that's why probably it would be useful if, if uh, I can share what I think, what the lessons we learned from this debate on the trade and environment synergies. And then I'll come back, uh, uh, come to the, to the Global South as well. So I would say that there are, for me, five key lessons, which I feel are quite relevant for the digitalization and environment reconciliation as well. First of all, awareness and education. Do people have enough information from both sides? That means, of course, information, research, but also correct information and right messaging. So quite critical for people and multi-stakeholders to understand what is at stake here. Number two, identifying and promoting synergies. Uh, nothing works like a win. And if there are those solutions, which I think were being referred to also, I think particularly by Daniel, if it could be shown that how digitalization can contribute to mitigating, adopting to climate change. And, uh, and so those kind of what we call uh, in our jargon, the win-win solutions, and if one can start from that by identifying that, promoting them, that, that could be quite a, quite a good beginning. Third, open and constructive dialogue. Not all issues are win-win. Clearly, some issues are there trade-offs, and we heard some of them in this session as well. And the, and the solution is neither to deny them nor to have a hostile conversation on them, but seeing, okay, how do we bring uh, our respective perspectives on that, share views, have an open and constructive dialogue to find solutions. Fourth lesson, I would say, multi-stakeholder and collaborative approach. We need to have, of course, policy makers. We need to have civil society. We need to have private sector. We need to have them both from the north and the south and the middle. So, so, so the larger the multi-stakeholder group and collaborative approach, the better it would be. I know that many of us, including me, become quite used to working in silos. I, I tend to call that a default approach <laughs> that of course brings more pro specialization as well as efficiency, but then we need to get out of our silos and having multi-stakeholder collaborative approaches is the way to go. And particularly in this area where we see the environmental community and the, uh, the digitalization community. So they, they need to come together. 
And finally, the, the key, another key lesson is synergizing in a way that leads to a common higher end. Like trade, digitalization is not an end itself. We are not doing it just for the sake of having more and better gadgets and more and better information. It is, in my opinion, I believe strongly, is a means towards inclusive and sustainable development, where it has to progress in a way that takes care of, of course, the social aspects, the environmental aspects. So having the larger goal in mind always is quite important. So these are the, the five uh, lessons that I, I thought could be quite useful for this. And I believe the multi-stakeholders and, and the, the IGF by having debates and discussion and providing a forum to talk about that can play quite a, quite a useful role. Now, let me briefly mention, because when we come to Global South, and I was glad to hear uh, the uh, several points made by Daniel, as well as the fascinating story from Gustav, which seemed to be saying that if we merge the the traditional ways of doing things and add this technology to that to understand it and to, to replicate it, that, that could be a way to go. Now, uh, when we talk about Global South, and of course I know it is large, it is from Asia to Africa, to Pacific, to Caribbean, to Latin America, and it is quite diverse. But something that is quite clear, uh, it, most of that is very limited capacities, human, financial, institutional, technical, technological, <laughs> we can go on and on. And I'm glad that you refer to that, Teresa, in, in your, in your, in your uh, one of the remarks. And at the same time, formidable developmental challenges. Extreme poverty is still relevant. And last year, it increased. And it is increasing more this year. Hunger is there. Uh, lack of access to clean water, clean uh, sanitation is there. You, you name it. So the, the developmental challenges are formidable and the capacity is very limited. At the same time, the other issue which you need to keep in mind, digitalization is still in early stages in most, most of that or many parts of that. We call it digital divide. I'm sure you all know of that. And that's why many in the South think they're first thinking when they think of digitalization is a way of catching up. Let's do what the rest of the world or the developed world had done it and we follow. So uh, this, this, this desire to catch up is very much there. And so that's why these things are very important to keep in mind. There are many other issues, but then as, as broad, while dealing with Global South, thinking of that, these things are very important to, to, to be clear about. So then the, to, to, to involve the Global South, and it has to play a role and must play a role, both in terms of proposing solutions, as well as implementing. The future of the humanity is united. Climate change does not distinguish between indigenous communities who have done nothing to do emit and, uh, and me living in Switzerland and, and with my level of consumption. Unfortunately, that is happening and we all have to, have, to, have to play our part. First of all, for the Global South, their views, concerns and expectations and their experiences should be actively sought. It is extremely important. Thus, uh, I don't have time to go into detail, but the innovations they can come up with sometimes kind of mind boggling. And so they have to be on the seat to share. Uh, then reconciling digitalization and environmental imperative should be constructed within their specific context. One of that, which I think Daniel was referring to, the technology. In their desire to catch up and reduce the digital divide, they are using absolute technology, older computers. We all know that. So what, what, what is more polluting, that is what they have now. So in that, if we want them to reconcile environment and digitization, we need to provide them better technologies, not the ones that are more polluting. And finally, uh, the third thing, which is particularly relevant for their policymakers, that encouraging them to think and take uh, 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 help in taking what, what we call the ecosystem approach that look, even while going for digitalization, that is not an end itself. It, it has implications. So are you already conscious of that by going down this path, by having these ambitious targets of digitalization by 2025 or 2030 that we see in many of their development plans, what are its implications? Like for example, on emissions and environment and how you can better take that into account. So thank you very much. Uh, these are these are my my few few thoughts uh, for the session today. But but I have learned a lot. So thank you.
Mm, and thank you, Rashid, for your very well organized uh, thoughts, definitely. And you did not disappoint in the sense that uh, that you brought up capacity building again up quite, quite prominently. Um, I would hope that also part of the efforts now, actually, at this minute, this hour, uh, the IGF, you know, covering these issues uh, is part of the, the journey of increasing capacities um, of policymakers uh, as well uh, and other uh, stakeholders, but it is certainly not enough. So so um, I do hope uh, that also in the context uh, of the IGF, we will have very concrete discussions of what concrete capacity building contributions to the issues of environment and digitalization, of course, uh, other topics covered by the IGF uh, can be uh, brought up uh, now to the community. At this point, I would like to turn to our chat moderator, Afi, uh, to give us a little sense of what has been going on in the chat. Uh, Afi, may I ask you to take the floor, please? If your connection is okay, please go ahead. Okay, thank you, Sarah. Uh, okay. Good evening, everyone. Good morning, wherever you are. Uh, in, the model, in the chat, we have a question from uh, Juliana and also a contribution for Daniel. Okay, from, uh, from Juliana, she was asking to know, and the question was directed to Gustav, how, how you manage the digitalization that, and how, how you manage the digitalized data from the CIPTEGEL, sorry for the pronunciation, which one of the data should, could share with other, others which one and uh, which one and uh, which one they, they still kept from the set because of the community hold. And the question was direct to Gustav. And we have a contribution for Daniel Akinde, who was who was saying, Thank you, Josh. Thank you, George. As a member of the PNE group, I sincerely believe all the group recommendations can be actioned. Action it. Personally, I'm contributing to the chapter looking at the over, overviewing of risk and opportunity. And I found the, the case that they're in for smart agriculture to be very co competing. And Teresa, that's all for now. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Afe, for uh, for following the chat uh, so carefully. So I could see already, you know, there was a good exchange between between Jorge and Daniel, and I uh, encourage others to, to do catch up uh, on the chat in detail uh, as well. Uh, Gustav, would you like to react to the question raised by Juliana uh, in the chat, please? Okay, there is a uh, thank you for the question. A very important questions uh, as uh, for the digitalization uh, digitalizations uh, process uh, in terms of uh, uh, how how we uh, digitalize uh, specific data or informations that uh, are uh, coming in from the uh, indigenous community uh, among the Kasapuan Cipta Gelar indigenous community they have this uh, belief system and uh, protocols uh, which basically uh, is saying uh, the sound is uh, more or less like this mipit kudu amit ngala kudu menta which uh, generally meaning that uh, everything that you took or you use or you utilize from uh, from everywhere you, you you need to ask for permission. So uh, basically, this common uh, notion of uh, accessing no the knowledge and uh, information is also uh, basically uh, applied uh, in that way again, uh, that you, you need to ask uh, permission. And uh, this uh, is in contradictory with the larger uh, community in Indonesia or the modern society, uh, so to say. Uh, within the, 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 the reach of uh, smartphones, digital devices, uh, sensors, and so on. Um, accessing or using things are no longer need to use or to ask for permissions. People can just take pictures uh, anytime they want. So this is a bit of problem in the context of Kasupuan um, Cipta Indigenous Community because when the non 
member of community entering their areas without any proper understanding of certain rule or customs, uh, people can just do whatever they want. So this is what we need to mediate it and what are also needed to be understood, understood and acknowledged that uh, each uh, indigenous community have their own protocols and their own ways in seeing things, including when we talk about the digitalization uh, process. But uh, saying to that, uh, the next question is not only uh, what about the digitalizations, but who owns the knowledge and who can utilize and who can uh, take benefits uh, on that. Uh, in our uh, context, uh, this 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 can stimulate a longer uh, longer and complex uh, discussion, because uh, again, uh, I think in terms of digitalizations, uh, uh, I think the main uh, purpose is to to make sure that this uh, knowledge or this information is accessible for uh, for greater uh, benefits. But again, uh, in, 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 in this particular uh, context, uh, sometimes uh, the non-indigenous community uh, member, uh, even though that the, um, the Kasapuan Ciptaglar indigenous community have uh, a very specific way in uh, accessing the knowledge and, and information, the non-member can have a different way uh, of seeing things and different values, and sometimes they are uh, conflict conflicting uh, to each other. And uh, of, of of course, this is not an easy uh, easy uh, uh, task. Uh, but uh, I think uh, respect uh, the, the the ownership of certain data and knowledge, uh, not only. Uh, in general sense, but also with the among the indigenous community is is I think pretty much uh, important in this sense. Thank you. And thank you, uh, Gustav, for the comprehensive uh, reply. Um, the chat is now also full of uh, several comments and resources. Thank you very much uh, uh, for that. Uh, besides the comments, uh, there is a, um, uh, there is a question from uh, Andriette um, on. Um, uh environmental impact uh and whether uh, uh the impact is still very new in the ict sector uh data centers uh, being brought as one of the examples and michael uh, ogia um uh has actually provided quite some comprehensive uh, replies there i of course invite anybody else to to contribute to this exchange uh further so um in the chat was also quite some anticipation about what the PNE, uh, which stands for the Policy Network on Environment, will bring. So that's a good segue, actually, to the next segment uh, of this discussion. And that is what the role for the IGF then. So I would like to start uh, with inviting Valeria uh, to sharing her reflections um, on, uh, on the role of the IGF in this discussion with us. Valeria, over to you. Thank you so much, Teresa and everyone. It is a real pleasure to be here and to contribute to set the scene for the IGF 2021, addressing the issue of environmental sustainability and the role of the IGF, the role that the IGF can play, which is so crucial you know, in the context of the overlapping current crisis and also for the future. So and in our view, part of the value of the IGF is that in its evolution, it has shaped its agenda to address issues of key relevance in line with pressing and emerging challenges that have internet governance implications. And as we all know, as we have heard, the world is really facing an unprecedented climate and environmental emergency and there is a still a long way to go in order to understand the ways in which digital technologies pose challenges to the environment but also the constructive role that they can play in confronting the crisis so um, this thematic issue is particularly complex and as we heard yesterday in the opening session of the preparatory segment of the IGF, the environmental crisis is such that internet governance arrangements will happen in the upcoming time in a context that is permeated by the success or the failure to mitigate this crisis. 
Thus, the IGF can substantially contribute to grasping the complexity around greening, greening digital technologies and to building the understanding of what technology developers, policymakers, technology companies, and other actors can do to mitigate the crisis, the crisis, but also to monitor and assess the environmental impact of digitalization and shape responses, including policy responses. Undoubtedly, both nuance and contextual use of technology and global responses are necessary for real sustainability to be achieved. But global responses cannot be provided, however, without considering, considering the specificity of the realities that are most impacted by the depletion of resources, pollution and destruction of ecosystem, and the way in which digital technologies are being produced, used and discarded. Realities as the one that Gustav talked about in the previous segment, for instance. In that sense, the IGF is a privileged space for the convergence of local experiences and knowledge, particularly those from the Global South, towards thinking and discussing global responses oriented to nurture alternative models of design, production, and consumption of technology. We believe that only by bringing diverse local experiences and knowledge to the forefront, it will be possible to contribute to the UN 2030 Agenda on Climate and Environmental Sustainability and also the SDGs, and the IGF is well placed to do so. So in the future, the IGF should build on the achievements of the policy network of environment. It has succeeded so far in bringing together and connecting people with different experiences around the various work streams and building in those experiences in the report that the policy network is producing. In particular, through the work of the policy network, the IGF can guide the operationalization of policy recommendations in contextualized ways. And in that sense, the, I, the IGF can play a key role in, break, in breaking down the high-level recommendations into actionable steps at national and local levels and complement in that way bottom-up approaches to sustainability. So by doing so, the IGF is well positioned to first uh, build linkages with relevant policy processes, including the United Nations Secretary General Roadmap for Digital Cooperation, with a common purpose to guide the use of digital technologies to, com to combat climate change and ad advance global environmental sustainability, but also connections with the Sustainable Development Goals, among others. And second, the IGF is well positioned to also explore and nurture a granular understanding of the co-shared responsibilities that the different stakeholders and policy processes have in the internet governance ecosystem towards addressing the environmental and climate crisis. I think it relates to what Rashid mentioned about multi-stakeholder collaboration around a common higher end. So in that sense, the IGF is also well positioned to identify research areas oriented to produce data and evidence in the perspective of shaping local and global solutions and responses, acknowledging that the struggle for environmental and climate justice is multidimensional and multidisciplinary, and that is necessarily a struggle for human rights, for gender justice, racial justice, health, and socioeconomic well-being, as well as, as a struggle for adopting other models such as circular economy. And as Livia pointed out earlier, joint efforts are needed at all levels, but by all stakeholders, and we do really believe that the IGF can contribute to shape, to shape um, those efforts. So thank you very much.
Thank you. Thank you very much, Valeria. Uh, a little side technical note, we could follow you well, but there was a little bit of a sound issue and I do uh, presume it's your it's your headset. Yes. Uh, okay. So maybe if you jump, uh, if you jump in further um, in the, into the session, uh, maybe try to um, use uh, just without the without the headset if possible sure. i think um, but we could still hear very well what you were saying and i, and I did not want to interact in uh, what i want very much is what you brought up actually at the very beginning of your of your intervention where you can kind of appreciate it uh, and if you can mute yourself now sorry about it because we have an echo it seems if you can mute yourself now valeria or if i uh, can ask uh, uh, Eleanor, mute Valeria. Thank you, thank you. Sorry. Yes. Um, um, there were you appreciated at the beginning of your intervention, kind of the role of the IGF to be able to kind of like react or address issues of key relevance. Yeah. So it has evolved. It's not like that we decided years ago with the IGF will be focused on ABC. Yes. It's a. Uh, it's kind of going with the flow and uh, and reacting. I would still challenge this a little bit that. Um, Yes, we can uh, we can address the main trends or the anticipated trends. Yet, uh, I feel that the IGF is still a little bit uh, you know cumbersome in quickly reacting to to some new new developments. Yes, for that uh, the process is. Uh, still uh, a bit lengthy. Yes, we've been discussing it in the Mac as well. Um, but um, uh, but this is um, this is just for another discussion, probably. Uh, I would like now to turn to uh, Florina, uh, who is, um, as I explained already earlier, uh, the coordinator. Actually, uh, she's a consultant with the IGF Secretariat now on the policy network of, of environment. So very concrete step ahead. Uh, for the IGF and taking up the issue. So Florina, over to you for your reflections, please. Thank you so much, Teresa. And um, I'm honored to be here and to be sharing, be able to share with you a couple of things about the PNE, which has been mentioned uh, several times this evening. And as I said, yeah, I'm really feeling honored to be uh, presenting here in good company after all these interesting inputs and also um, Huge thanks to Valeria for giving this input about the IGF. I'm also a bit of a newcomer to the IGF world, and I'm uh, constantly amazed at this uh, kind of really discipline at the multi-stakeholder approach, which is not always easy, but is really, I feel, a, a big benefit to, to the IGF's kind of approach and the IGF's, um, yeah, the result that we, we can see. And I think the PNE so far has been a truly collaborative uh, multi-stakeholder endeavor. And uh, we have tried from the beginning to really be as inclusive as possible. And I'm just going to share um, some slides with you. I'm also going to put um, the slide deck or the link to the slide doc. Uh, it's a Google doc in the chat. So you may all follow and have a look at them afterwards too. So let me just um, share this. Can you see this now? Yes, we can, Florina. Perfect. Then I'll switch to presentation mode. So just a few, I, I don't know how many of you are really familiar about what the policy network is, even though it has been mentioned a couple of times and several familiar faces who have contributed to the p &E are in this call today, but still I just, want to show this graph so it's meant to kind of show the idea of the policy network so it's supposed to be um, as always within the IGF kind of this multi-stakeholder collaborative initiative where we have several goals but since we've only just started out this year our main first goal of this network is to publish a report that contains concrete actionable policy recommendations on how we can achieve global action in this intersection that is the main topic of this session, so environment digitalization. So this is our first uh, output that we're striving towards. And after that, of course, we have other goals, as we said, or, or side goals um, that we want to achieve and that we always want to be mindful of. We really want to be cooperative and collaborative. And we want to kind of also take into account the local level. But of course, since we've only started out, we cannot address everything at the same time. So we've focused our, or we had a focus in the past a couple of months since launching this initiative on this report. And the report is, as I said, the main thing we're working towards now here. I've just pasted a screenshot of what the outline of the report looks like. In the first couple of months, we've had a good exchange with the working group um, 
where uh, of which members are also here today and we've kind of worked out which issues we want to tackle and then the network has been steadily growing and we've involved more people to join us on the work of this report. We have worked with, and I've linked the IGF um, p &E website also in this slide uh, doc, and you can find it there and have a look at it how to see how we uh, structured this work. So basically it was until last month um, and anyone or everyone who was really interested, who had some knowledge uh, in these topics could sign up to be a co-author on one of the work streams. We have established work stream a work stream for every topical area that we're going to address and where we formulate recommendations on. So as you can see um, here, maybe more appealing in a visual overview, we have this, we have an introduction, we have an overview of opportunities and challenges, and then we have these core thematic chapters where we kind of want to just to make it a bit more accessible, we focus on, on these, these areas. The topic is so large, so of course there are so many different things that one could be addressing and different frameworks you could apply, but that's just the way we've chosen to structure it, but there are others, of course, this is no final or kind of answer, but we have decided to go this way, so we have said that our main issues are environmental data or main issues are environmental data food and water security, supply chain, so the whole issue of transparency and circularity, and then overarching issues, which is a bit where we collect um, things that are yeah, overarching, as, it, as it, the title says, um, such as um, mirroring issues that have been, fortunately, I'm glad to say that they have already been discussed this evening as well, so capacity building, uh, for example. And I have just compiled a couple of examples of recommendations that we formulated so far. This is really work in progress. I have linked the report in the slide before, so it's very open. Feel free to scroll through. You'll see that um, we are very obviously still working on it. And we have an important date coming up the 17th of November where we want to have or hold a big open consultation. So really feel free and invited to join us there. You'll find all of the information on the last slide on how to join. And there we will give a more uh, visually pleasing overview of uh, the recommendations that we've compiled so far. But this is just to give you a little insight as to um, what kind of recommendations there could be. So what the work streams have come up with so far. So for example, we have this topic of environmental data where the group has said that it would be important that states, so this is targeting UN member states, um, should establish or use global standards for the development and implementation of a digital product passport. So for those of you from the European Union, you might be familiar with that concept since the European Union is striving towards this with their Green Digital Initiative. Um, and also they have been uh, said or advocating that it sh there should be increased cooperation for greater impact and interoperability. So obviously interoperability is a big topic with environmental data. Then we have another work stream on food security where we said, and I think this ties nicely um, with what um, Gustav has said on in digital knowledge as well. So there we said, or we came up with this um, kind of recommendation that whenever there is the issue of digitalization of food and water systems, then always this should be context specific. So it should ideally respect and complement traditional systems instead of trying to transplant them or trying to kind of just replace them with something digital that is maybe not even better than what has been existing before. So we should try and strive towards, or we in the sense of policymakers, should really strive towards um, involving and empowering local communities at all stages. And then um, I'm just going to maybe not take too much time because feel free to read through this because it's a lot of material, but we also have these other uh, work streams on supply chain circularity, where it's also about standards, a big topic that we're addressing and to give you an in kind of a, an idea of what we're talking within the overarching issues chapters is, for example, we have said that one issue is competing motivation. So obviously there is a lot of lobbyism at stake or going on as well, which is also justified, but can result in skewed decision-making, which we cannot afford with climate change because it's such a pressing issue. So there again, we have insisted, or we would like to insist with this report that it's important that uh, at all stages, kind of um, local actors 
have a strong voice in designing environmental initiatives that are related to digitalization and otherwise, of course. And also what has already been said too is this issue of capacity building. So obviously if you want to involve local communities, then they need to be able to participate in a way they need to have the capacities to understand what's going on, to use the tools, et cetera. So we make the recommendation that it should be uh, possible to build on existing new structures, to build on existing education and to really involve, so to really strive to involve a digital literacy um, strategy with all education measures. So to really prioritize this um, as part of education of youth. So that's just uh, some of the recommendations that we're formulating. So you might um, see that this is quite global, quite high level, I would say, but I guess that's also in a way, or we can discuss this in a way necessary because we are a multi-stakeholder group and an international group. So we cannot formulate a recommendation adapted to every specific local context, but I think this would be an interesting next step to really see which of the recommendations could be applied in kind of which way and what is necessary to um, yeah, we should really involve kind of the local communities to see, okay, how could this be applied and what's the context. But uh, with this report, we really want to give recommendations that give kind of a push to see or to tell governments or to give, inspire them ideally to for ideas on, on where to go with this um, intersection of digitalization and environment. Yeah, so just uh, we have a meeting once a month, a PE &E meeting. Um, we're approaching the end of this year, so we'll only have uh, one more left actually before the actual IGF, which I'm hoping that many of you will attend in Katowice and where we will present this report. But as I said, um, we have this November 17 meeting, which I really would like to invite you to. We also have heard from Daniel, who is also a co chair. Uh, of the PE, so if you have any pressing questions, you may also address him. But otherwise, feel free to sign up to our mailing list so that you will receive the invitation to this open consultation where we look forward to your input and your comments and feedback on the recommendations that we've compiled. That's it for now. I think <laughs> feel free to to ask anything you're curious about. Thank you very much, Florina. Uh, this was useful. Uh, thank you also for sharing the very concrete timeline and opportunities for the community uh, to get uh, uh, involved. Mm, it was interesting also to hear like what specific approach you took to the format of the report, giving giving the the IGF and what's appropriate uh, for a forum uh, like this um, uh, to present in terms of recommendations. So we are all very excited to see the final product uh, at the IGF. Uh, just to correct you uh, for uh, for IGF in Katowice, you actually do not have to travel to Katowice to uh, to participate uh, in the session in the report launch because uh, the IGF is a hybrid event so uh, you can as well if you cannot travel or do not want to travel attend uh, uh, the IGF virtually and should have a very comparable uh, experience. So uh, back to you Afi because there is the red number uh, kind of flashing uh, on my screen indicating that there are things going on in the chat. Could you give us a little uh, taste um, of what the discussion has been over there please? Okay, I uh, I cannot uh, I cannot hear uh, Afinau, Juliana. Yeah, I know you were a plan uh, plan B backup. Uh, could I ask you quickly to just give us a little flavor because we start to be a little bit pressed for time. Thank you. Hello. Yeah, uh, there is some discussion on data center here, babe, because some some people is exchange exchange information about the data center and the impact of. The footprint, the footprint impact on the on on the environmental and yeah, uh, is the uh, the other is there. Uh, there is some question from from Andriet to the Florina to the PNA working group, uh, especially uh, the the question is, uh, do your approach environmental data and in, include the locally relevant data? that Gustav show us, uh, she said the no need to ask the question, just respond to the chat is enough. So maybe Florina or 
can uh, respond say, respond sp speaking respond or just just writing on the chat so I it's not a choice has sorry sorry i didn't want to yeah. interrupt yeah uh, joyce also has the response is a, a agricultural data is also briefly mentioned without any specific tip so maybe if Rurina want to add what Joyce put on the chat about, uh, especially about the data and environmental and local community. I think she's perfectly answered it. I would refer to, to, to this group for further information and to attend on, on November 17th, but otherwise I'm, maybe Joyce wants to add something uh, in the chat or, or via microphone, I don't know, I would give over to Joyce since she's more of an expert on environmental data than I am. Uh, sure, so this is Joyce speaking. Um, yeah, just to repeat what I mentioned in the chat, which is that for the section on environmental data in, in the PE report, we really are looking at consolidating different sources of data uh across different types of data so we won't have the opportunity just because of the word limit to really go into much detail into one or two specific types of data um, and so i mentioned as well that we we do mention for example agricultural data as one type of data but we do not specifically go into it in in, in any kind of a in-depth discussion just on this because we are in the recommendation, we are looking more at how all these different um, resources can be consolidated in, into one global resource. Uh, and what are the sort of policy criteria that would go into creating something like this, uh, a globalized resource? Uh, and as well, you know, what are some of the challenges that we might face that we would have to overcome in order to develop something like that? Uh, so we really are taking more of a high level and a much broader sort of global view of data resources. Um, but of course, um, if we find that there are relevant examples uh, or good relevant examples that cut across local all the way to global, then we can put those into the brief as well. So we can find a way of mentioning it. Uh, thank you very much, Andriette, Florina, and Joyce uh, for the reactions uh, on that question. So uh, we've heard now quite a lot about um, uh, what the role of the IGF can be. I have one more mentee for you uh, that I would like to share. Let me first go back to the first slide to, uh, to remind you uh, where to go uh, to, to the website www.mente.com and enter the code uh, for this session, which is 18788698. I will repeat it in a bit. And uh, the second question that I have is, what are some of your suggestions for the IGF main session on environment uh, and digitalization? Uh, I again, I repeat the code um, uh, in case uh, you need it, but you should be able to see it at the top of your screen, uh, 1878. 8698. Um, I will give you a minute. Uh, and again, I do uh, count on you that uh, this is uh, this is visible and good. Thank you, Andriette, also for reminding um, uh, this in the chat. I'm getting nervous now that uh, that nothing is appearing. So I will do a little test. That's me, yes, for full transparency. So it works. So I do count on you to help me out here. And if you have any trouble, you know, just unmute yourself and go ahead. And um, do we have trouble? Or you, you don't want to interact? Uh, Teresa, I think there is a, there is a, trouble uh, yeah. there is a trouble but not for everybody it seems because we start having uh, having some feed uh, feed uh, coming in but what is the trouble uh please uh, thank you to those that uh, that um, are bringing in so once again you know it should be very simple going to www.menti.com and entering the code 18788698 
And uh, we have some good uh, suggestions for the IGF main session that our issue team really should take into um, consideration. Links to human rights, very important. We will take it into account. Discuss next steps for the PME. So I think this is also quite important because yes, we will have a big milestone now. We will have a report, but what next? Yes, is this something that should be sustainable part of the IGF? Uh, and what can it bring after uh, issuing a report uh, that we are expecting in a few weeks. Digital literacy initiatives on environmental data, excellent. No corporate greenwashing, please. Okay, thank you. Uh, bring local perspectives. Uh, I'm happy that we were on a good way also today uh, with, with Gustav's intervention. Serious focus on in, uh, environmental impact assessment, how to bridge internet governance with environmental sector. Mm -hmm. Invite more speakers uh, in environmental justice movements in the global south. Thank you. How to deal with rebound effects. Look at concrete models and approaches for design, production, and consumption of digital technologies. I will be taking a screenshot uh, of this because we will make sure uh, that, um, you know, with Juliana, uh, who is the main facilitator for this issue team, to really take into account uh, your suggestions as we polish uh, the format uh, of, the, uh, of the main session. So thank you very much uh, for this. This is extremely uh, useful uh, for us. So as we are slowly getting to the end of the session, I would just like to quickly uh, remind you that we will have five workshops at the IGF um, in the environmental team that made it through quite competitive, if I may say, selection process. You might have heard the numbers of the workshop proposals that were actually received by the MAG. And uh, there was some very difficult work uh, uh, do, done in a very transparent way, uh, I have to say. Uh, um, evaluating all of these proposals. But I will just quickly uh, tell you the name to give you a little bit of teaser of what's coming up. So in addition to the main session, uh, and the session of the PE, uh, we will have a workshop on cutting carbon in digital world myths and facts. Another workshop will cover e waste management, how do we achieve circular economy? Next one, uh, critical times, impact of digitalization on climate change. The next workshop will focus on achieving sustainable local tourism and nature conservation. And last but not least, the uh, big data for environmental sustainability. You can find details on each of these workshops uh, at the IGF website. There is a description for each workshop and you can already build your schedule for the IGF to make sure that you're available for these particular workshops. With that, I would quickly like to go back to uh, Juliana uh, to give us a little summary uh, of today's session. Okay, thank you, Teresa and the speakers for the interesting session. Uh, I will share. I will. Uh, I will doing some quick take out for our discussion, and this is this is uh yeah the the key take out will be more complex and global, but it's just quick take the take out from the our discussion. So it's. You can see uh, the meeting refer what what the impact of uh, environment from digitalization, what the technology can do for the environment, and then what next you can do. So Teresa, we, we have Jennifer here, and uh, Jennifer is one one of session organizer on on one of workshop session organizer on the environment. So maybe Jennifer want to share what they think about the, the session, what they think about the issue area on this session. So maybe. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Juliana, for that. You know, And Jennifer, it would be our pleasure. We are a little bit tight for time. So if you could maybe uh, focus rather than describing your session, because we can find it on the website on like, what are some takeaways from this uh, preparatory session that you can possibly reflect uh, in your workshop at the IGF? If you can hear us, Jennifer. Okay, we seem to have a connection issue there, which is which is no no problem. Um, so, 
First of all, I do hope that uh, we will see each other virtually or in person in Poland, in Katowice. Please do uh, register uh, for the IGF, no matter uh, of your mode of participation, you have to register uh, to access uh, uh, any, uh, any, of the, any of the sessions that we have planned. I thank you and appreciate the time that you decided to spend uh, at this session. Thank you for your very valuable uh, contributions that we will make sure uh, to take into account. I wish you a very nice evening uh, or afternoon and um, see you soon. Thank you uh, to everybody. Thank you, uh, Juliana, uh, for putting this session together. Thank you, Afi, uh, for the chat moderation. And Eleonora for your support, of course, on the tech side. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. Great work. Thanks. Great session. Thank you, Andrea. We appreciate it. Stay healthy. Thank you very much. Bye bye, everyone. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye bye. Very good. Thank you very much, Juliana. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you for. Yes. Yeah. It was, it was pleasant. It was a pleasant session. Yes. <laughs> very good. And I think we have some excellent.